Chapter 13, The Dynasty of Maharaj Nimi, text number 7. Ganda Vastu Shuta Deham Nidaya Muni Satama Samate Satraya Jecha Devan Uchu Samagatan Translation, during the performance of the Yajra, or Chaga, the body rel relinquished by Maharaj Nimi was preserved in fragrant substances. At the end of the Satra Yoga, Yaja, Yaga, the great sages and Brahmins made the following request to all the demigods assembled there. Rajna Jiva Tu Deho Yam Prasanna prabhavo yadi tatet yukte nimi praha mabum ne deha bandhanam If you are satisfied with the sacrifice, and if you are actually able to do so, kindly bring Maharaj Nimi back to life in this body. The demigod said yes to this request by the sages. The Maharaj Nimi said, please do not imprison me again in the material body. Purport. The demigods are in a position many times higher than that of the human beings. Therefore, although the great sages and sages, saints and sages were also powerful Brahmins, they requested the demigods to revive Maharaj Nimi's body, which had been preserved in various perfume bombs. One should not think that the demigods are powerful only enjoying the senses. They are also powerful in such deeds as bring back to bring life back to a dead body. There are many similar instances in the Vedic literature. For example, according to the history of Savitri and Satyavan, Satyavan died and was taken away by Yamaraj. But on the request of his wife, Savitri, Satyavan was revived in the same body. This is an important fact about the power of the demigods. Text 9. Yasya yogam navanchanti viyoga bhaya kartara pajanti charnam bojam muneyo hari medasa. Arjnimi continued, My bodies generally want freedom from accepting a material body because they fear having to give it up again. But the devotees whose intelligence is always filled with service to the Lord are unafraid. Indeed, they take advantage of the body to render transcendent loving service. Purport, Maharaj Nimi did not want to accept a material body which would be the cause of bondage, because he was a devotee. He wanted a body which he could render devotional service to the Lord. Srila Bhakti no Thakur sings, Janma o vi mare icha yadi tora, bhakti grihe jani janma ha umora. Kita Janma Hau Yata Tuyadasa. My Lord, if you want me to take birth and accept a material body again, kindly do me this favor. Allow me to take birth in the home of your servant, your devotee. I do not mind being born there even as an insignificant creature, like an insect. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also said, the Danam, the Janam, the Sundarim. Kavitam Vajkadisha Kamaye, Mama Janmani Janmani Shwari, Bhavatad Bhakti Rahai Tu Kitwaye. O Lord of the Universe, I do not desire material wealth, materialistic followers, a beautiful wife, or fruit of activities described in flowery language. All I want, life after life, is unmotivated devotional service to you. Shikshakshika 4. By saying, life after life, janmani, janmani, the Lord referred 
not to an ordinary birth, but a birth in which we remember the lotus feet of the Lord. Such a body is desirable. The body does not think like the yogis and jnanis who want to refuse the material body, become one with the impersonal Brahman of holdings. The devotee does not like this idea. On the contrary, he will accept any body, material or spiritual, where he wants to serve the Lord. This is real liberation. One has a strong desire to serve the Lord, even if he accepts the material body, there is no cause of anxiety. Since the devotee, even in a material body, is a liberated soul, this is confirmed by Srila Rupa Goswami. Iha yasya harer dasye karmana manasa gira nikilasya vivapsapsu jivan muktasa ujrite. Person acting in Krishna consciousness, or in other words, in the service of Krishna, with his body, mind, and intelligence, is a liberated person even within the material world. Although he may be engaged in many so called material activities, the desire to serve the Lord establishes one as liberated as liberated in any condition of life, whether in a spiritual body or a material body. In a spiritual body, the devotee becomes a direct associate of the Lord, but even though a devotee may superficially appear to be in a material body, he is always liberated and engaged in the same duties of service to the Lord as a devotee in Vaikuntha. There is no distinction. It is said, Sadhura Jivo Namaro Va. Whether a devotee is alive or dead, his only concern is to serve the Lord. Tyakta Deham Panar Janma Naiti Mam Eti. When he gives up his body, he goes directly to become associate of the Lord and serve him. Although he does the same thing even in a material body in the material world. For a devotee, there is no pain, pleasure, or material perfection. One may argue that at the time of death, the devotee also suffers because of giving up his material body. For this connection, but in this connection, the example may be given that a cat carries a mouse in, in its mouth and also carries a kitten in its mouth. Both the mouse and kitten are carried in the same mouth, but the perception of the mouse is different from that of the kitten. When a devotee gives up his body, Tyatva Deham, he is ready to go back home, back to Godhead. Thus, his perception is different, certainly different from that of a person being taken away by Yamaraj for punishment. A person whose intelligence is always concentrated on the service of the Lord is unafraid of accepting material body, whereas a non-devotee having no engagement in the service of the Lord is very much afraid of accepting material body or giving up this present one. Therefore, we should follow the instructions of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Mama Janmani Janmani Shore, Bhavitad Bhaktiya Haitu Kitwai. Doesn't matter whether we accept a material body or a spiritual body, our only ambition should be to serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Mama Vishnu Vraya Krishna Prasthai Bhutale, Srimate Bhakti Vranta Swami Tanamane, Namaste Sarasutunde Ve, Gauravani Vracharane, Nirvi Shesha Shunivadi Paska Dhyade Satarna. Bhagavad Gita Krishna says, Ye tu dharma mritamidam, ye toktam paripasate, shadadana matparama bhaktas te te vame priyaha. That one who accepts this imperishable science of devotional service, making me the supreme goal, he becomes very, very dear to me. Ye tu dharma mritamidam, ye toktam paripasate, shadadana matparama bhaktas te te vame priyaha. In other words, the faith that if I simply render devotional service to Krishna, then gradually I'll come to the spiritual platform. And that if one comes to the spiritual platform, then time, place, circumstance doesn't really bother one. We find that whether one is in a situation like the Pandavas when they were in the cat when they're in Hastinapur as the emperors of the world, or whether they're in the forest remembering Krishna, for them there was actually not much of a distinction. In one sense, being in the forest and well, in exile was probably more pleasant for them, 
because they didn't have so much to, you know, all these responsibilities to worry about, they could just concentrate their minds in Krishna consciousness. Therefore, Krishna says at the end of the 17th chapter, well, it's in the 15th chapter, Evam, 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 Asamudo, Kichanati Purushotma, Sasarva Vipajantemam, Sarva Bhavena That anyone who knows me as the Supreme Personality of Godhead without doubting is said to be the knower of everything and therefore he engages himself in full devotional service. Iti Guyatamam Shastram, Idam Yukpa Mayanaga. Etam Bhutva Bhudimatsyat Krita Krita Shivarata. This is the most confidential part of all the Vedic knowledge that anyone who becomes who knows this will become wise and his endeavors will know perfection. In other words, our progress in Krishna consciousness depends upon our understanding how Krishna is God, at least. He's more than just God, but at least knowing how he's God. And then being willing to render unalloyed service to him. That way we actually realize that he's God. And as much as we accept Krishna, then to that extent our problems are solved. And to the extent we don't depend upon Krishna, then we remain in the material conception of life and we struggle. Trying to do things without Krishna is simply a struggle and as we depend more upon Krishna, then this struggle disappears. Therefore, Maharaj Nimi did not want to accept the material body. He didn't want to, and Prabhupada says here specifically, he didn't want to accept a body in the consciousness that, of trying to enjoy or control the material energy. But to accept the material body with the idea of utilizing it to serve Krishna, then one does not become entangled because one remains conscious of Krishna. And as soon as one is actually conscious of Krishna, then one is on a different platform of experience. Of course, the neophyte devotee is also somewhat conscious of Krishna, just like an iron in the fire is somewhat in the fire, as long as it stays in the fire. So if it keeps in the fire, then gradually it becomes hotter and hotter and becomes just like the fire. Although one may be a neophyte devotee, if one keeps oneself in the fire of Krishna consciousness, then gradually one becomes more and more and more conscious of Krishna. And as we become more and more conscious of Krishna, then we become less and less conscious of our material conceptions and our material experience. Material existence is more or less material conceptions. We have so much imagination, what we think is going on, but actually what we think of what's going on is just our imagination. It's not that there's nothing going on in the material world. There's many things going on. Everything that we see before us is going on. We just have the wrong conception of what's going on. We're covered by a particular mood or a particular conception. And as long as we have those conceptions, we may take one body after another. Krishna says, Shriram Yadavatnoti, Yat Chap Yukramati Shraha, Krihi Vaitani Samyati, Vayor Ghanda Ivashya. The living entity, he's carrying his conceptions of life from one body to the other, just like the air is carrying aroma, and thus he takes one kind of body and gain it to take another. Air is always pure, but when air comes in contact with roses and it smells very or aromatic. When the same air comes in contact with garbage, then it smells very foul. The air hasn't changed, but due to association, sometimes it appears to smell very aromatic and sometimes very foul. Similarly, the soul, according to its conception of life, is experiencing the material world sometimes as an enjoyable place, sometimes as a miserable place, and usually as a combination of both. But as the conception of life becomes purified, then what is that purification of the conception of life? That no longer one imagines oneself as the enjoyer or the controller of material nature, and therefore one is not subjected to the 
influence of lust, anger, and greed. And as long as one is subjected to lust, anger, and greed, then one's conception of life will be diluted by material consciousness. It's not that delusion comes simply because we haven't studied books enough. And if we study books enough, then gradually we'll understand everything. No. As long as we're accepting lust, anger, and greed, then as long as we don't accept Krishna and rather than lust, anger, and greed, then to that extent we we're covered by illusion. And as long as we're covered by illusion, then no matter how much we read and try to understand things philosophically, we won't be able to understand. Therefore, philosophy is not meant simply for armchair speculation. It's meant for service to Krishna, and in that service to Krishna, give up the mentality of trying to lure the old material nature to enjoy it. Of course, in the beginning we may render service, but that service should also be done with some consciousness, not simply mechanically, or that I'm a devotee and therefore I'm rendering service and therefore my life is perfect. Although one actually has to render service and then try to develop at the same time the proper consciousness. And if one is rendering service in the proper consciousness, then one gets Krishna's association by that service, and that way the service becomes perfect. Not simply by rendering service, but by rendering service in the consciousness of trying to please Krishna, doing what Krishna wants in order to please him. Then one will naturally remember Krishna, one will become conscious of Krishna, and then one's mutual conceptions of life will go away. Otherwise, we may wonder why so many devotees come, they render service, and then after some time they disappear, and no one knows what happened to them. If they're still on this planet, they're in some other heavenly planet, where, where do they go? No one even knows. We used to call a bloop. They bloop. Nowadays, of course, people don't bloop sometimes. They, they hang out. You find out where they are on the Sunday feast or something, if there's a big festival then suddenly they manifest themselves. <laughs> and you find out they're living right around the corner. <laughs> but it is too far away, the temple, to come to. Because their conception of life is that Krishna is all right. It's not all right. I mean, we accept Krishna. He's a nice person. But he's not very important in our lives unless we need something. That their conception, of, our conception of God is usually rather limited. It's the person you go, he's the big daddy, you go to when you need something. Or as I said before, he's the big baker in the sky. And when we need some bread, we, we go there and we order some bread from him. My dear baker in the sky, please give us our daily bread. And he comes on the back riding a Garuda to deliver our daily bread. <laughs> so these conceptions of life, as if Krishna, he's, sometimes he's God in our lives when we need something, and then he conveniently disappears when we don't want him to be there. But actually, the material nature works in such a way that as long as we're trying to lower it over material nature, as long as we forget Krishna, or as uh, Maharaj Rishabde said, evam, evam sat karma, evam nat karma with some pryung te, abhidhyamani pudiyamane, pritirna yavana maivasi deve, namunchante yoga, namunchante deha yogena tadva. That so long as we have these upadis, I'm thinking on this body and I'm identifying with so many things in relation to this body, and as long as we don't develop our love for Vasudev, then for so long we have to take one body after another. So the goal is quite simple, and the method to get to that goal is also quite simple. The goal is to recognize Krishna as God and then do our activities in order to please Him under the guidance of His devotees. Then the result is when we become Krishna conscious, then naturally our love for Krishna will develop. 
So it's not that we love Krishna and then we will serve him, of course, because we have some love for Krishna and actually we're serving him. But our love deepens by service. Our love deepens as Krishna reveals himself to us. It's not that we have to add anything to Krishna to make Krishna more attractive. Krishna is unlimitedly attractive. He says that the jewels on Krishna are not decorating Krishna, but Krishna decorates the jewels. But in order to become conscious of Krishna, we have to render pure service to Krishna. It's not that whenever Krishna reveals himself to me, then I'll start rendering service to him. That's the other way around. When I render service to Krishna, then he'll reveal himself to me. Therefore, uh, hearing about Krishna is meant to help us develop faith that there is a Krishna and that I should render service to him under all circumstances and then when he reveals himself to me, then my material conceptions of life will go away and I'll be able to experience unalloyed happiness. But, because we remain attached to the idea of that whether there's a, there's a God or not, that I have my interest in this material world, and that only when God reveals himself to me, then I'll give them up. But God won't reveal himself, himself to us as long as we remain attached to them. And even Krishna t tries to take things away from us sometimes, then we become more attached to them. We may have had some book we never read, and then someone steals the book, and suddenly I want to read the book. <laughs> Where is that book? <laughs> and we become frustrated, and anger, anything. We have a pen we never use, but if someone takes the pen, then suddenly I develop an interest in the pen. Therefore, Krishna doesn't usually, for most devotees, take anything away because then they become more attached to it. And Krishna wants to get rid of our attachment. Sometimes, for a devotee who wants to be a devotee, but is overwhelmed by obligations and attachments, sometimes then Krishna will take those things away because one won't become more attached to them. One will take shelter of Krishna. So Krishna is very intelligent. He knows when to take things away. And sometimes he knows when to give things to the devotees too. Because if we, Krishna only took things away, then the temple would be very, even less devotees would come. Let's go to the temple and have our material life destroyed. <laughs> so, in one sense, Krishna wants us not to be attached to the material senses, but he doesn't want us to become so much by poverty, one becomes attached, and by opulence, one becomes attached too. So material existence is quite tricky. One can easily become attached either by being deprived of something, then one becomes even more attached to it, or by having too much of something, or hankering for too much of something. Therefore, Krishna tries to get us to come hear about him regularly so that gradually we become aware of him, the fact that he exists, and then becoming willing to do some service for him. And as we do service for him with trying to please him, recognizing him as actually the owner of everything, not just, you know, the temple room, you know, the temple room in, Girl, in, uh, in his temple in, in Gurley Street. But he's actually God everywhere. It's not he's the Hare Krishna God. We have our deities in the temple. We have our Radha Kalachandri here. And they have their Rukmini Dwarkadish in Los Angeles. They have their God. We have our God. And the Christians have their God. And some people don't have any God. Now God is everywhere. He's God for everyone. Whether we recognize him or not, he's the owner of everything and his police force is equally everywhere also. Maya is, an, as I said yesterday, I think, she's an equal opportunity employer. She employs anyone who wants to be Maya, who wants to get Krishna, Krishna, Maya, throughout the whole universe, she engages them in her service immediately. You don't have to make a job application for Maya. She immediately will engage you 24 hours a day. You want a job? 24 hours a day, just simply forget Krishna and Maya will engage you. And we can remember Krishna everywhere, anywhere, at any time, and engage in his service 
especially by chanting Hare Krishna. And therefore, gradually get out of the material concept of life. As Krishna sees our sincerity, that we're actually trying to pay attention to him, and we're trying to decrease our emphasis on maya, on illusion, then he reciprocates and gradually makes some progress. And then one day, whether we're in the material body or not, won't make any difference because wherever we are, we'll have an equal determination to serve Krishna. So we'll stop there. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Yes, Maharaj. You were mentioning a few minutes ago about how many people will approach God when they need something and when they get that need fulfilled and they go away again. Would it be the solution to the problem uh, to see the, how we are dependent or need God at every moment? And if we're completely dependent on Him for uh, the ability to see or to breathe or to even live, then we, that dependence would lead us to gratitude and eventually the desire for service, correct? Yeah, sure. I mean, well, of course, if we hear how we're dependent, then we'll hopefully we'll become inspired to render service, so we'll become aware of Krishna. But for most people, what they have to do is come regularly or have some program of regularly hearing, so that by that hearing they become inspired to render practical service to Krishna. Then they'll realize how they're dependent on Krishna. Right now we may hear how Krishna is controlling everything, but it doesn't really impress our hearts very much. Because you can, as, as it says, you can hear about the glories of someone, but if you don't love them, those glories seem insignificant. But even your child, they get an A in school on a math test, and you're calling up all your relatives, telling how your child got an A in math test. For an ordinary person, the fact that someone has learned how one plus one is equal to two, or two plus two is equal to four, it's not a big deal. But for you, it's a big deal because you have some love for the child. So similarly, when we love Krishna, and we hear about how he's controlling everything, then it has a lot more significance than if we don't love Krishna. If we don't love Krishna, we hear how he's controlling everything, we get envious. Why is he controlling everything? <laughs> Anything we can do to stop his control? Yes. Thank you, Maharaj, for the nice class. Uh, my question is that uh, somehow that understanding is there that I should serve Krishna, I should serve devotees, but that consciousness is not like it's just like like I'm I'm pushing myself. Okay, let's do the service, and consciousness will come. So, <clears throat> what are the important things which I need to take care so that the right consciousness also develops slowly? Hear regularly about Krishna with attention and some respect. Then we'll see we're not engaged in some ordinary activity. You know, I had a choice. I could have become a lawyer or a devotee, but somehow or another I chose to become a devotee. It's not exactly like that. You know, it's not like one of the many choices and we just happen to choose this one. That's an opportunity to get a body which is, or at least a consciousness, which is full of bliss, completely aware, forever. So what can compare to that? But if we think it's one of many choices and it's, you know, somehow or another I, I, I got involved in this, I might as well try and do something, then it's not really understanding things very clearly. And on the other hand, we should try to chant Hare Krishna with attention and try to chant to Krishna and Shamati Rarani, actually asking them to engage us in their loving service. that we can see how sincere we are by how sincerely we're chanting. So we should try and chant sincerely and listen attentively. Then we'll see, then when we experience what the difference is between matter and spirit, naturally we'll choose spirit rather than material conceptions. But if we don't experience spirit, then our material conceptions will seem quite important. Just like if you're on the ground, you walk around in a neighborhood, all the houses seem very big and important. But you're up in an airplane, 30,000 feet high, and you look down at the ground, you can see it's all very insignificant. So 
but we have to get off the material ground into the spiritual realm. Then we'll see things in a better perspective. Anything else? So it was nice being here. We look forward to coming again. It's nice to see how the devotees are either in the temple hearing the class, or we hear that there's many devotees hearing, or there's some devotees hearing the class outside in unknown houses. So there may be devotees that may be walking by a house and they're actually listening to the Bhagavatam. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's I look forward to coming again. Thank you for your association. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Grantaraj Shumad Bhagavatam ki jai. Gaur Pramanande. Gaur Pramanande.